Glad to have you back. Now, the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission is the apex consumer protection agency in Nigeria. The commission, in fulfillment of its statutory mandate, deployed different regulatory tools to monitor and modify behavior of service providers and manufacturers. But the challenges that face Nigerian consumers are enormous, from epileptic services to bad products. Uh, we can go on and on. The Commission had utilized campaigns to increase consumer awareness and ensure their interests well are well protected. Many consumers in Nigeria are ignorant of their rights and also products uh, that are not good for maybe for consumption. But from time to time, the FCCPC published list of products whose consumption and sales have been banned. Well, let's just move on. I have the Chief Executive Officer of FCCPC, uh, Mr. Babatunde Iruke, right in the studio. Thank you very much for uh, joining us on the studio today. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I want to start this way. From CPC to FCCPC, there is a change. We have FC added to it. Why did we expand? <laughs> Good. Well, I, I suppose what it is is that um, prior to 2019, uh, Nigeria didn't have a comprehensive competition regulatory framework um, and th that was late in coming but it's good to come anyway. Um, Nigeria was one of only two top 35 uh, most populous countries in the world that didn't have a competition regulatory framework. The other one simply being the Democratic Republic of Congo and we're the only one in the top 15 economies that didn't have a competition framework and so it was something that was important. Um, there's no country in the world that had privatized uh, public enterprise, the magnitude that Nigeria had, without privatizing them into a robust uh, competition framework. And so uh, it was something that had to come at some point. We've arrived late at the party, but it's still important that we join the party anyway. And so uh, competition, as it were, is, is also a tool of consumer protection. It's to ensure that the markets operate in, a, in an optimal manner, that the market is fair, to remove restraints from others getting into the market and to eliminate existing barriers, to make sure that there are no um, understandings, whether they're vertical or horizontal or restrictive uh, uh, mutual understandings that distort the market from operating in the fairest possible way. When markets operate fairly, everybody benefits. First, it encourages investment. There's a lot more uh, operators in the market. It certainly promotes choice, innovation, and fair pricing and quality. And so I think it was an important thing that we did. Um, now we have the law and uh, we're going through the throes of enforcing the law. First of all, restructuring an existing regulator. Um, and so the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act repealed the Consumer Protection Council Act and also transmuted the Consumer Protection Council to the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. And one might ask that, why would you want to proceed with an existing regulator? Now that dual regulatory role seems to be what is uh, becoming more predominant in the world, even in the West. And so it made sense that uh, the regulator that was closest in role uh, to what competition does for the market should be the regulator that would take on the new additional responsibilities. Oh, okay, well spelled out. Now, now, let's not look at, we, we, many Nigerians don't even know their rights. That is one thing. Like for me, before now, to when I buy something and I don't get satisfaction, at times I just get to ignore. But I think now the awareness is getting more. What have you been doing to educate Nigerians to really know that you can come to us and we would address this challenge for you? We've done a lot, uh, but I'd be the first person to say it's still a drop in the bucket. First, there's a cultural um, complacency that is um, associated with our nature as Nigerians. And um, with complacency always comes, it's okay. Uh, so that's a fundamental bedrock of that. Secondly, you've got a very vast country. The vast majority of the people do not live in urban areas and in, or in the cities. And there is, you know, the language is very different. Culture is very different. And so getting the right um, um, messaging uh, for a country like that, it's quite challenging. Um, but what we've done is to start from what we think are the um, um, low-hanging fruits, uh, which is at least uh, engage people in the urban areas and get them to more robustly demand and insist on their on the enforcement of their rights. And so one of the things that has happened is that we use technology a lot. We have a completely new 
automated complaint uh, resolution mechanism uh, that is online. We also have a telephone application for complaining, uh, for filing complaints. But beyond that is that uh, I, as uh, an operative of the organization, and the vast majority of the other operatives of the organization are active on social media. So we're harvesting complaints even from Twitter, and we're responding and calling companies out and getting their attention there. Yeah, because that, that's the only way to scale up uh, our efficiency anyway. And so uh, I would say that, um, do we still have a lot of work? Yes. And uh, I intend okay, to proceed with guidelines in a regulatory framework that requires companies themselves to carry some of the consumer um, rights and uh, consumer protection rights messaging as part of their activities to ensure that um, uh, people uh, remain loyal to their custom and because companies have figured a way to advertise their products to every nook and cranny of the country so even the two or the three year old in the, in the remotest village of Nigeria can discriminate between brands of what that child wants mm -hmm. and that's not uh, that's not uh, um, superficial it's work that the companies have done to make sure that they can modify behavior with their messaging. And so it's important that they use that work, the research that has gone into that, also as a vehicle for carrying consumer uh, rights to, to consumers. In, in all of this sounds interesting, but there are some challenges. And I know it's not really easy. I heard of the time you went to Uyo and all of that, I was called. And you know, I know how, how has it been? How has it been the challenges you face carrying out your day to day activity? Well, the, the, the challenges are um, multi dimensional and multi layered. Um, some of it is what I've just discussed about yes. the difference um, in culture and uh, the vastness of the country. And some of the other challenges is just still a coordinated approach to regulatory work, making sure that. Uh, the handshake between regulators and uh, industry is a sufficiently tight handshake. And also, we're coming from a long history of not paying attention to something like consumer protection, both from a, a regulatory standpoint and also from an operational standpoint. And so companies are used to you know, doing the best they can. So their own individual um, codes, their own individual standards of consumer protection or customer care, as they would call it, was what they complied with. And so to impose a standard that is higher than that or something that is uniform is obviously something that's going to take time to uh, become uh, a culture. And we're working at it. I think we've done quite well, um, but it's difficult to see how well it is considering how far the road ahead still is. The road really is so far, <laughs> the road ahead. I, I want to talk about this sector, the electricity sector. I attended like two of your town hall meetings. There was even one that NERC was represented and all of that, talking about estimated billings and the issues, metering and all that. How well have we been able to address some of those challenges? Uh, where do we stand with regards to issues around electricity consumer protection? Good, so I'll slice the approach to that into three because that's what can really um, uh, make, it, make the assessment most meaningful. And, and the three uh, slices are one is um, what our advocacy and the approach we've taken is doing to the re in the regulatory space that is uh, adding, ad uh, adding pressure to what we must do uh, from a regulatory and a provider standpoint. And then secondly is the resolution of complaints for consumers. And then thirdly is what it is doing to industry. Now from the um, regulatory pressure, We've taken very strong positions and been an outlier sometimes. And um, with risk, for instance, in estimated billing, uh, it's very clear to me that the real problem is not estimated billing, mm -hmm. as it were. The real problem is arbitrary billing because uh, it's going to take a while to meter. I mean, just think about all who consume electricity in this country. Every home, every hut, every room and parlor, everyone having their own different meters. Uh, it will take a while. And so what needs to happen is that the arbitrariness in the billing is what needs to stop. There's a lack of transparency generally in billing in Nigeria, whether it's electricity or telecommunications and the, you know, even television services. The moment we can bring some transparency into billing, even medical billing, itemize it, show what each cost, then we'd be able to at least gain some control over that process. And so for if um, uh, uh, the bills, the estimated bills, had some rational connection 
to the real consumption, both from a real use standpoint and from a downtime standpoint. And there's a clarity to consumers that you expect that you'll be metered in X number of months or even 12 months or one year. But in the interim, you would have to live with these estimated bills, which are truly reflective of your consumption. I think we, would, we wouldn't be in the place where consumers are nearly as aggravated as they are. And so that's, that's uh, working. We've got uh, the map rules and NERC is responding quickly and it remains to be seen how well uh, some of these things would work out. From a consumer standpoint, we're resolving hundreds of complaints on a daily basis. Whether it's estimated billing, I didn't get a meter, I was wrongly disconnected, group disconnection, I paid my bill, my neighbor didn't. We're resolving complaints every day. But what is very clear is that if we're resolving that many complaints on a daily basis and you still have a problem this large, it means there needs to be some broad <laughs> industry intervention. Indeed. And that is the engagement that must continue. And that's where the town halls have come in. And so what the town halls are is just a melting pot where we bring um, consumers and bring the distribution companies to the same uh, place where they resolve some complaints, they get feedback about what is going wrong and what is not right, and um, that works. But what would really be helpful is when finally we uh, in the FCCPC, together working with the NERC, find a way to intervene broadly. Um, we might not be able to immediately improve the amount of electricity supply, but if the distribution companies were just more sensitive and responsive, at least we can reduce the tension. Before, before we go, my, my director is telling me that we're running out of time. Yes. Uh, what's your message to Nigeria? It's the end of the year. We're moving to 2020. What more do they need to know about FCCPC as we round up? Well, what I'd like people to know is that um, there's a commercial contract when you're buying or using anything and that there are obligations in there. And sometimes your expectations are inconsistent with obligations, but there's a minimum standard and you should know that those who provide services or sell goods to you are not doing you a favor. They owe you certain obligations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Babatide Ruker. It's been big talk with the Chief Executive Officer of FCCPC, breaking it down, letting us know our rights and how we can always get it right. Thank you so very much for your time on the show today. Thank you.